Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Versus Stars podcast. How my loyal listeners, thank you for your continued support. And remember, click the subscribe button, everybody. This is an amazing episode because Don Lewis boards the mothership. You know her as Jalisa Vincent on A Different World. She now plays Captain Freeman on Star Trek Lower Decks. Come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Miss Lewis. Thank you so much for coming to the Versus Stars podcast. Hey, good to see you, Jeff. You as well. It's an honor to speak with you. Me and my wife are big fans of Lower Deck, so thank you so much. My pleasure. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. So I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for acting and who your earliest influences? Wow. Inspired my love for acting, to be honest with you, was old movies. When mm -hmm. I was growing up, there were certain movies that would come on seasonally, like at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. So people like, uh, wow, wow. Um, Judy Garland, watching mm. her in her old movies, Mickey Rooney, Danny Kaye. Danny Kaye was a big favorite of mine because Danny Kaye could sing and dance and he did that like Gilbert and Sullivan type patter type mm -hmm. stuff. I used to watch all the all the, the road movies with Bing Crosby and, and Bob Hope. Uh, there were a lot of movies that I just became addicted to and I would learn them. I would learn the dialogue. I would learn the musical numbers. Mm -hmm. I would learn the dance routines and be prepared for when it came on again. Uh, so there were shows like that, that really encouraged me to be open to being all these different characters and personalities and just be free with it. Because as an actor, that's one of the first things you have to learn is how to get over yourself <laughs> and not feel self, no, seriously, and not feel self-conscious about an, an accent or if you're looking silly or, you know what I mean? If, if you're hmm. being serious or, or funny. The ability to make people laugh and, and cry and experience joy or not be afraid to demonstrate fear because that's what, what your characters in movies and in TV shows and in, and in plays did. Uh, so yeah, and one of those earliest influences of like, I can do this and I fit and I can be here, no cliche was actually Star Trek. Fantastic. It really was, it really was. So. Where does your confidence come from to be, to kind of let yourself go like that? I mean, someone like me is very self-conscious about what I'm doing. How are mm -hmm. you able to get past that? Um, I think because I did it in the safety of my home, mm. for one, and um, it kept me out of trouble. So I was never told, when are you going to stop making those funny voices? When you, no, that's not true. My grandmother used to tell me, because I used to imitate people all the time and imitate accents. And she used to say, you need to stop doing that because one day your voice is going to get stuck like that <laughs> and et cetera. So, and now you know, God rest her soul. She passed away a couple of decades ago. If she could only see me now, says, I bought my house <laughs> other people and doing all these voices. Uh, but I was raised with three blood brothers, no sis sisters. So I was always in an environment, always surrounded by guys playing mm. basketball, running track, playing handball in the street, stickball, all those kinds of things. So I got to see guys, men, as my friends, mm. as another extension of me, as opposed to someone I needed to impress or be overly concerned about the kind of person I was in order to be accepted. Uh, later, you know, you become a teenager, you learn, oh boy, I really like boys. This is like, oh my gosh. But now you've already been entrenched and being mm -hmm. comfortable in your own skin that, you know, you learn that if you can't be comfortable with me being in my own skin, then you're not the guy for me. And that's kind of how my career and my acting choices developed is when you're comfortable in your own skin, you're willing to take risks doing other other things. Because I must admit, when, when you see, um, watch you on TV or um, listen to you in Lower Decks, you have a, a very, like, powerful presence about you is that where that comes from from being around guys and, and standing your ground i think so and for some reason people think i'm bossy <laughs> the character certainly is <laughs> the, Car oh, my. the carol freeman is so over the top no i am i may be uh decisive like carol freeman <laughs> 
but she bellows like everything is on 12. And then when we're recording certain episodes, they say, okay, we need you to be really agitated here. I think more than what I've been to, uh, seriously, Ka- Carol Freeman needs Xanax in the worst way. She really, she needs Quaalude, she needs vodka, she needs tequila. She needs a joint. She does. <laughs> uh, she just really, I was like, okay, Carol, we get it. It's a crisis. Take it down a thousand. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I love it. I love it because Dawn is smiling. Dawn is laughing. Dawn, yes, I can make up my mind, but there's always room for somebody else's idea, for somebody else's input. Uh, I don't always have to be in the lead. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you're not going to do it, fine, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> but if if you're able to do it, great, because then I can go do something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but Carol Freeman, yeah, I, I love her. And I love <laughs> the episodes where they let her be just a little off center, a little off wacky. Uh, I think those are hilarious. Like when she forces the crew to go and relax and she's the one right. <laughs> like blowing a gasket. Yeah, and yeah. I, th- I think it was so fantastic about you as well is that you're actually multi talented. And the we're talking about Captain Freeman and the story, and we're eventually gonna get to the, those characters and those ambitions. But for you, you were um, started acting, if I read correctly, at age 11. You graduated mm-hmm. from the from high school of music and art at 16. I did. You're you're not like half assing your life in any way, shape, or form, are you? <laughs> So, uh, I, was, I was definitely like, okay, now now what? <laughs> now what? I was that kind of a kid. Once I got my foothold in one thing, I was like, oh, that's cool. Now what? Now what? <laughs> so yeah, I'm still that kind of person, actually. So you, as someone who has experience um, who uh, for composing, how did that skill occur? And is there a similarity between understanding music and understanding acting? Uh, particularly voice acting and music, I would I would say. I started writing at a very, very early age. I got uh, a little child's, they used to make things called Magnus, M-A-G-N-U-S, Magnus organs, where this had a set of buttons on one side and then keys, like like a regular piano. The Mm. buttons were chords and it came with books of you would play this key to play this melody and you push this button for this chord. So I thought I was, you know, (laughs) gonna be Stevie Wonder. I did, you couldn't tell me anything. So I'm writing songs. (laughs) I'm writing songs at eight and nine years old, and each of them had no less than probably 12 verses. Um, And I think my very first song that I wrote was about Noah and the ark. And I went through each stage. The first verse was, you know, God telling Noah to build the ark, and then is it gonna rain? And then the people laughing at him, and then the animals. I think I had a verse for every animal and and forced my family to sit and listen to it. Uh, so I was always writing. I was always doing music. I was always writing poetry. I had some of my poetry um, put into a compilation of young authors by the time I was 15. Wow. So this is something that expressing myself creatively has always been something I wanted to do. Uh, before television happened, before voiceovers happened, uh, I was singing and dancing. Uh, doing Broadway, off-Broadway. Broad, I was also lead singer in a band. I had a record out. I thought I was going to be a recording artist. Uh, so some of my songwriting made it into the hands of the musical director of The Cosby Show. So he invited me to write the theme song for this new spinoff called A Different World. So that's how that happened because I was already established as a singer musician in New York City. So he reached out to me because he knew me as a musician. I'd never met him before. I had just finished doing the national Broadway tour of the show, The Tap Dance Kid, which was cast by the same casting directors as The Cosby Show. After begging them for several months, please let let me audition and being told no, they finally changed their mind and called me and said, okay, if you're still interested in audition, come in and audition. Within 10 days, I'd booked the co-star spot and written the theme song for A Different World which put me in a completely different strata of oppor- opportunity. So within a couple of years of doing the different world, I got invited to do voices for the cartoon series, Kid and Play, that was produced by Suzanne DePass that used to help run Motown Records. She was interested in managing me as a singer, actor, performer. And she says, well, I got this opportunity, come and do this. And that had to be at least 34, 30 years ago doing that. And that opened the door. It introduced me to this world 
a voice over animation. I'd been a session singer you know, singing background vocals for my projects, other recording artists, jingles, that kind of thing. So I was accustomed to being in front of a mic mm. in a recording studio, but not doing these voices that my grandmother urged me, don't do that or you'll get stuck. And all the voices that I'd ever had in my head, all of the accents, all of a sudden, can you do a South African accent? Yes, I can. Can you do a British accent? Yes, I can. Can you imitate a, a, a Yiddish, a Jewish person? Yes, I can. How about a teenager? Yes, I can. How about a seven-year-old boy? Yes, I can. <laughs> and off went my off went my career. So as a singer, and because like in animation, they don't see your face. Mm. They don't get, get to see all of the expressions or the body language or the gestures. You really have to convey every emotion, every thought, every every nuance simply verbally. So mm. as a singer, as a musician, understanding and appreciating melody and harmony and, and, and rhythmic patterns, all of that are things that I tap into whenever I create any kind of voice. Does the person speak with a staccato accent or do they have a nice, languid, liquid, mm. warm quality to their voice? You know, all those kinds of things, changing timbres from speaking very high you know, raising your voice and lowering it down and making it sound warm and sexy. You know, all of those kinds of things, that's where music plays in my head for every character that I, I create. You know, I think one of the coolest things that you mentioned as well um, is that, like I said, you did the theme for A Different World. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about sitting down and, com and composing, which I always find fascinating, how are you finding the essence of a show in which to compose the music for? And how did that help you inform your own character of Delisa uh, Vincent? Well, it really depends on what the show is about. What is the tone about? When they approached me about that particular job, it was Lisa Bonet going off to college with the support of her parents, but she has to make her own way. She's going to make good choices. She's going to make bad choices. Something I could relate to having basically just graduated from college, starting so young at 16, leaving my hometown, New York City, going several thousands of miles away down to Florida on my own, basically, you know, saying, yes, I have a goal. Yes, I have a vision. Um, and now's the time to put up or shut up. So now you find yourself relying on the things that were deposited in you, the things that, that you were taught, the things that really annoyed you when you were home. Now, all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I did just clean up my room without anybody shouting at me because I have a roommate. You know what I mean? All those, yes. I did just go to the financial aid office and apply for, you know, a student loan or, you know, whatever. I just, I have college work study. I actually did just show up to my college work study job on time. So all those things that have been, you know, are in your ear and they're annoying, you know, clean up after yourself, <laughs> take a shower, take, all these things. Now you're responsible to do yourself. So mm. all of that poured into my lyric choice when I was writing the words for about these young people going off into this next phase of, of their life, constantly drawing on the messages that were deposited into them by their parents. Mm. So yes, so it meant a lot to me to be able to write that. That was, that was genuinely us, us a salute to my own mom and my grandmother and my teachers who spoke into my life. You know, the teachers who taught me the value of cherishing the positive things in me as opposed to focusing on all those things that made me so insecure and self-doubt and affirm what the bullies were saying about, about me, trying to intimidate me away from who I could possibly be. So it was mm. those teachers that spoke that into me. Do you know what I mean? So, I yeah. mean, all of those things along that journey. And since then, any project I get asked, to write music for. I've got music as underscore for different films, whether they're Disney films, different projects that I was working on, uh, as well as arranging vocals and things for other artists and for other shows. You get a tone mm. that has already been set. Some Sometimes the film is already shot and they need a love song to go under this particular scene. So you get a vibe for what's already been established and you do your best to be part of that fabric to weave into that vibe. So I'm very, very grateful. In fact, for my songwriting in 2021, I was inducted into the Women's Songwriters Hall of Fame. Congrats, congratulations. Thank you, thank <laughs> That's you. Awesome. It was me, yeah, it was, it was me, Naomi Judd, uh, uh, Valerie Sim Simpson, 
Roberta Flack, uh, Mary Che Chapin Carpenter. There was there was a list. There were about eight eight of us that got inducted in two thousand twenty one. That's a huge honor to me. That's that's very cool. So when you're beginning to compose, is there like a particular instrument you're thinking of first? Is it a a, a sort of like a, a sound that you're trying you first kept, latch on to? Uh, I am a singer songwriter and I play enough piano to write. So it really depends on the tune. Again, it really depends on the vibe that I am creating. Um, the le legendary saxophonist who passed away a number of years ago, Gro Grover Washington Jr. was a dear friend of mine. And I really wanted a song with him on my CD. So I wrote a song called Too Saxy because he played saxophone. So it was for him playing both soprano and alto sax and mm. then me singing. So I wrote that with saxophone music in my in 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 my head. And uh, he'd unfortunately passed away like of just just a few weeks before we were going to go in the studio and record mm. it. So I had a friend and protege of, of his come in and basically emulate him on the track playing soprano and Barry Barry, Barry sax. So other things for me as a singer, I hear the melody, I hear the mm. words, I hear the nuance first. For instrumental pieces, uh, again, it's about creating the vibe. Uh, a mm. song that I wrote for a Disney movie, movie called Whispers was took place, takes place in Africa and it's, it's with African elephants. Kind of like the movie Babe where the pig talked and the animal mm. talked. For this one, it was the elephants. So they had a whole, I had some jungle underscore music with some uh, vocal sounds. It really wasn't a melody. It really wasn't a, um, I'm sorry, it really wasn't a lyric, but the melody was in the drums. It was very mm. percussive with different tribal rhythms going, going through it and the tonation of some of the in instruments that are used in that con country, yeah. So, so when you're thinking uh, as well as like I said, uh, voice acting, are you doing the same thing? Are you starting with a sound of a character, mm -hmm. or are you starting with oh, just you you starting off with sound? I'm starting with the sound of a char character um, because sometimes they send us illust ill illustrations. This is the projected look of this character. Sometimes they don't animate it until after you've done the voice, but mm -hmm. they've got an idea. You're you're doing the voice for a hedgehog. You're doing the voice for a robot, you're doing a voice for a woodland creature, you're doing a voice of a senior citizen or a child. So immediately, hopefully for the actor, it invokes, what does that sound like? What does a typical teenager sound like? What does a typical, you know, someone who uh, is, a, is a plant, is a beautiful flower as opposed to a cactus? Do you sound prickly? Do you mm. sound, you know, lovely and warm and, and fuzzy? Are you a are are you a beast? Are you an alien? So yeah, uh, hopefully you get some kind of sound, and then then you get the you know the phonics that go along with it. So so when you came out with Captain Freeman's voice, what was the sound that you that first heard? You said this is her. This is her. Captain Freeman was a combination <laughs> of Captain Kirk and Commander Cisco, very all cool. in one. <laughs> very efficient, very staccato. You will hear what I have to say and I will mean it. And then, so it's kind of like me, but just taking myself way too seriously. <laughs> and, and then they added the everything on 12 aspect <laughs> with her and uh you know tawny's character just bumping heads just me and beckett are just constantly bumping heads and uh even then they find ways okay so this is her this this is uh captain freeman's warm voice which for someone else is just not shouting <laughs> <laughs> captain freeman's warm voice is me just not shouting how about that uh so uh yeah yeah, I loved it. I loved it. And when we auditioned, I, I didn't know it was for Star Trek because we had to sign non-disclosure agreements and they had different characters. I wasn't a human being. We, we were all animals. I think I was like Captain Duck or something. I was, I was a duck. So no, and it wasn't until they had booked us that they actually told us this is the new animated Star Trek. I was like, you have got to be gay. <laughs> <laughs> I was over the, I called my brothers. You don't understand. From the very first episode back in the 60s, we, it's one of those things when I tell you, 
I was a kid that would watch stuff and learn the dialogue and learn the man. <laughs> we could we could replay entire scenes. We could replay entire episodes. One episode, I would be Uhura. One of my brothers <laughs> would be Spock. Somebody else would be Kirk. Someone else would be Sulu. Oh yeah, great. Oh, we knew we knew all of it. We knew all of it. It was just genius. I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely over the moon. And one of the first people I called after I called my brothers was Nichelle Nichols. Oh, very cool. Because by then, Nichelle and I had become friends here in Los Angeles. And uh, I was like, Nichelle, you will not believe the gig I just booked. And when I told her, both of us were so excited, so happy, because uh, I fortunately got to tell her many times before she passed what an inspiration she was to me, seeing myself in her mm. in the future, being a badass. <laughs> she was, no, she was the person they came to her. Uhuru, what does this mean? Can you can you connect with them? Can you connect us? And she would be with them, you know, thigh high boots and a mini skirt and all with her phaser going down to the planet's surface and making sure things were handled and handled well. She was amazing and she was gorgeous and she looked like I look like her. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you chose when you're saying talking about Captain Freeman and the inspirations of Kirk and Cisco. You chose two of my my two favorite captains from Star Trek. So congratulations! <laughs> I, I yes, I mean I must admit, Deep Space Nine is my favorite of the Star Trek. So it is just how it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you're playing uh, Freeman, as you mentioned, a very strong character, you were inspired by um Uhura, who's a very strong character as well. How important mm -hmm. was it to portray the character like this as a strong, confident female? As a as a starship captain, Star Federation spaceship captains are known for their excellence. They're known mm. for their problem solving. They are known for being able to delegate, even though more often than not, they're the point person. I'm out in front, but I need you to do this, 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 and you to do this, this, and this, because once we everybody falls in line and fills mm. their lane, we can do nothing but succeed. So Carol Freeman, even though the Cerritos is not necessarily known for its excellence, she still has to lead and mm. she still needs to be relevant. She still needs to be viable. I did not want her to be a joke. Mm. I did not want her. I wanted her to fail doing her best to succeed. If she was going to fail, she was going to fail while doing her best to succeed. And so it can't really be called a failure. We just didn't maybe do it the way you would have done it. But it was it was it, it was done. And well, the great thing is that the characters from Star Trek, the captains are role models. I mean, kids look up to these characters. Mm -hmm. How is it um, to have that feeling of leadership as a role model for young viewers? You know what? In addition to being a role model and setting a standard of this is how we figure this out. And this is how I am not going to ask you to do anything that I would not do as a, as a leader. The difference with Carol Freeman or the added element is that in this series, she's also a mother. She's also mm. a parent. You know what I mean? So parents don't always get it right. As much as kids accuse you, you know nothing. You know how to do nothing. It's like, well, we're all still learning this parenting thing. Mm -hmm. I had just gotten the adult thing. <laughs> I'd just gotten the career choice thing, breaking the ceiling to be a female captain thing. And now here you are. Now I got to be responsible for you and your feelings and your maturity. Okay, enough. You know what I mean? So watching them find their way, watching them find their way, not only as colleagues, but as family, as, mm. as blood, you, you count on for the Cerritos. You count on your crew to be your crew, to be your partners. But as a parent, you're not that partner. Mm. I, am the, I am the leader. I am the one you go to. I'm actually the administrator. As, as as a parent. So that's a that's a really precarious juggling act. And we get lots of comments from people saying that they really love the dynamic between myself and, and Beckett, mother and daughter, colleague, you know what I mean? Yet, yeah. yet superior at the same time and watching us work through things. I've had a lot of people say, you know what, what you did, I'm gonna try that <laughs> with my mom and maybe it'll work in reverse or mothers saying, thank you, now I get why me and my kid keep bump bumping heads and try to, no, seriously, and try to find a path where this is how we can talk with each other better. Even if it's for five minutes, we're going to do this better. 
with each other. I think that that's awesome. That's well, awesome. That's why I always wonder um, when you think about the relationship between um, Ensign Beckett and Captain Freeman. There's obviously a lot of friction, and every episode. I mean, it's sometimes for entertainment, but it, but it's but it's there. Um, is it is that friction derived from love, or is it disappointment on the on the part of Captain Freeman? I think she wouldn't be disappointed if she didn't love her, hmm. because if if she didn't love her, she would just have her kicked off of the ship. You know what hmm. I mean? There'd be no need to be disappointed. You would just be replaced. You would just be gone. So, like any parent, you want you want the best for your young person, for the child that is in your care, that you are hoping to groom to be the most uh, successful human being that they, they can possibly be. So any parent, if you see them missing the mark, if you see them falling short, especially if, if they're not genuinely trying, then yes, you get dis disappointed, but there's always that thing in the pit of your gut that says, I know you can do better. I see nothing but the mm. best in, in you. And which is something that all of us wish our parents could somehow find a way to express to mm -hmm. us and and us then actually receive and not constantly feel like we're being berated or chastised. But um, no, I think it's a combination of the two because I love her so much. Um, that's why there is there was so much of a space for disappointment. And I think that's the same for her as well because well, I'm sure she did her best to hustle every other cat mm -hmm. captain she ever had. <laughs> But at a certain point, she, she still wants my approval. She still wants me to care, and she still cares. Well, I, I think my favorite episode on Lower Decks, or one of my favorite, is Temporal Edict. Um, it's the one where um, the crew is saved when Ensign Boimler, uh, sorry, I'm probably always pronouncing names wrong, convinces Captain Freeman to loosen her control of the crew. So okay. is rigidity the flaw of Captain Freeman, and what is then her strength if that's her flaw? I, I would say if rigidity is her flaw, I think her rigidity offsets the laxness of the mm -hmm. crew. I think if she were not as rigid, the crew would go that much further into laxness. So I think their end of the spectrum and Captain Freeman's end of the spectrum is what allows them to come into the middle to actually get accomplished what needs to be accomplished. But if you want to call rigidity a flaw, her her strength, I think, is wow, in problem solving. Mm. I love to see her wheels turning, whether and it usually ends up being some kind of scheme, whether it's tricking Beckett into like, okay, we're just gonna make you an officer. The one thing you most hate in the world is I see your potential, so we're just gonna give you the bars, we're just gonna give you the yellow. And and you're, you'll be great and watch her fight against it. No, no, I'll be good. I'll I'll <laughs> behave. No, don't make me do that. You know, or when she gets into the nightclub and she starts scatting and she's like, yeah, I've got a plan. Hey, I'm <laughs> Captain Carol Freeman and I'm going to sing Scooby Doo by five to you that day. You know what I mean? She, there are sides of, of her that she's always got the wheels turning. How do I get done what needs to be done? So, yeah. yeah. So, why do you think I mean, she she seems she's very capable. She has um, you know, the crew. Why does she seem like she keeps needing to prove herself to the Federation about how good of a captain she actually is? Well, I think there's so many deeper messages uh, in the in, in the Star Trek world. And I just have to applaud, uh, applaud our show creator, Mike McMahon for really being able to tap into that, into the different layers without hitting anybody over the head with, with mess messages. Do you know what I mean? About mm. cooperation, about um, not minimizing people, about not discriminating, about um, don't uh, take things for granted kind of a, a, a thing. Carol Freeman, when you're on a ship, where you don't get all of the glory, you don't get all the hype about the, being the first one to discover this or you know break ground with that. Your job is to basically keep the broom going behind the elephants in the circus, <laughs> circus so that everybody coming behind you doesn't keep stepping in all of the crap. <laughs> yeah. That's our job. So for some, they don't, you don't get lots of applause for that. You don't, you're like, yeah, 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 but that, yeah, whatever, whatever. That's what you're doing. Yes, it's necessary, but uh, who, you know, 
It's no, it's it's not some beautiful great shakes. You don't get parade. You clean up after the parade. Yeah. So people already want to minimize you. They already want to look down on you. Uh, so then being female, being a person of of color, being I think we did a whole episode where I go to be the liaison and they're mad because Janeway wasn't wasn't there. <laughs> It's like seriously, I'm 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 a captain too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not Janeway. We want Janeway. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, oh man, I get I get no breaks. I get no love. So yes. So you find yourself constantly saying, "I'm I'm worthy. I can do it." <laughs> <laughs> so, what can our listeners look forward to for season four of Lower Decks? Is there any scoops I you can give? I wish I could tell you, <laughs> Jeff. I wish I could tell you. No. <laughs> They would they would take my captain dots off of my <laughs> collar. I can't do it. And you know what? We did something down at Comic Con where uh, I said something like the thing that I thought was the most far fetched, ridiculous idea, and Mike McMahon looked at me <laughs> because it was actually a storyline that was oh, coming no. up that I didn't know <laughs> about. I was like, "You're really we're going to do that? That doesn't really." I and I thought when they asked me for a teaser that I was saying like the most outrageous, ludicrous possible thing that there could have been. And it turns out it was an actual storyline. So I've learned my lesson. I keep my mouth shut. So. All right. I'm going I'm to ask a question. And if, if, if you can't answer it, feel free to just push it aside, brush it aside. Okay. Are, are we going to see further development in the Beckett um, Captain Freeman relationship? And is it a positive development or a negative one? Let's see. I always think more information is a good thing. So yes, you will see more. And yes, it's positive. Very cool. Um, so what's next for you? What is next for me? Uh, we're wrapping up recording season four. Uh, so I'm still doing that. I do voices on a number of other animated shows. I play Mrs. Washington on Ludacris's show, Karma's, Karma's World. I'm still doing The Simpsons and you know the list goes on. I'm grateful for all of that. And then I have my nonprofit organization, the A New Day Foundation. So we are gearing up for experiences for our teens for next month, for Black Heritage Month. We're taking uh, about 30, 40 kids to the um, Regenerations exhibit at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. They're doing a re retrospective of African-Americans in film and television starting from the 1920s. Uh, so we're taking our teen girls, our teen boys, and then in June, we're going to be gearing up for our annual conference. It's called Focused and Fit, F-I-T, which stands for Financially and Technologically Informed. Focused and Fit for a Different World conference, where we do workshops on financial literacy and technology for high school juniors and seniors and their parents and college freshmen and sophomores. So that'll be taking place early June on the USC CAN campus. And at that conference, we give out scholarships, anywhere from six to 12 of $2,000 each and a new com computer to Very competing cool. students. Yeah, so we've got a, we've got a full, full plate. Uh, Talk a little bit um, about your um, nonprofit, uh, repeat the name and, and what that is specifically. You're, I'd be more than happy to okay. chat with that about you. Excellent. Uh, my nonprofit organization is called the A New Day Foundation, which is a play on my name, Dawn, A New Day. But uh, our mission statement is also that we want to create a new day of opportunity for those that we serve, underserved youth and families and communities across the country and abroad, um, so that where you were yesterday is not where you will necessarily be today or end up tomorrow. Uh, so we do programs and financial support for teen girls called Sisters Hang Out. And it's teens 13 to 19 and teen boys. It's called Mentors, M-E-N, capital T-O-R-S, which stands for Men Talking of Relevant Situations. And we organize for them every quarter things that we call experiences, where we expose them to cultural and career opportunities that they don't normally have access to. Everything that the foundation does is done free of charge to our participants so all they have to do is, is show up. So once you're invited, you, you commit to showing up and we take care of the rest. That's how we can afford to give out scholarships, provide workshop materials, pay entrance fees, transportation, all of that for all of our participants. We just wanna make inf information available and encourage all of these young people and the families, their parents as well in certain cases uh, toward being their best self. 
towards being their best selves and seeing themselves succeed. So, uh, so for our, our listeners, a little more, just to get a little more information, how do the teens get involved with your the program, and how can our listeners help with the funding and help with the program as well? Oh man, thank you for asking that, Jeff. You can go to our website. It's www a new day foundation.net if you go to the site it keeps a calendar and up to up update of upcoming events or you can of course email us directly at, at info at a new day foundation.net when you go to the website it has options there for you to don donate every dollar every dollar 500 one dollar 1000 whatever it is all of it 100 percent goes to providing these opportunities and scholarships for those that we serve. So by all means, check out the website. Uh, it gives a list of upcoming events or you email us directly and we will directly keep you in the loop with our mailers. Well, not so much mail, but you know what I mean? Newsletters yeah. or in, in invitations to whether it's one of the experiences or to the annual conference here in June. Well, for the listeners, um, if you go to check YouTube, we'll have in the the the, the, the uh, notes the website, so they can click on it right there, and they'll help them. Thank you. With, hopefully, with their donation, I want to thank you so much, Miss Lewis. You're absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you thank so much you, for talking Jeff. with me. <laughs> oh, my absolute pleasure, Jeff. You take care. All right. Live long and prosper. Yes. <laughs>